My name is Chris Adams. I'm the Director of Training at the National Press Foundation. We have with us Erica Groshen, who is a Senior Extension Faculty Member at the Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations. She is also a Research Fellow at the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. And most pivotal for this, she was the uh, uh, Commissioner from 2013 to the 2017 of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the entity that puts out the jobs report uh, the start of every month, usually, usually the first Friday of every month. This uh, for July is going to be on Thursday because of the holiday. So we are going to um, talk about the jobs members, how they get developed, some of the controversies around them. Um, and so I want to welcome Erica. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me, Chris. Sure. And. Um, for all of our listeners out there, there are two ways you can ask questions. Uh, you can raise your hand. You'll see a button down at the bottom that says raise hand. Once you've raised your hand, um, when we get to the Q&A session, I will call on you. We will unmute your microphone and then you can ask uh, audio. You can ask your question um, directly to Erica. You can also type in your question in the chat function, or I'm sorry, in the Q&A function. And um, we will, I will then see those and I'll read those questions to Erica. But we'd like to have as like to have as many audio questions as we can so we can have a, little, have a little bit of the feel of the old days when we did things in person and in a briefing room. So I just want to give you a little precursor for why we're doing this program today. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of you know the jobs report comes out every month and every once in a while there is a bit of controversy about it. This last month, the May jobs numbers, which came out at the beginning of June, um, there was a weird, a, a weird quirk in the numbers uh, that Erica is going to talk about. And because they were so odd, there were, were, there were some people who were wondering, have, have somehow the numbers been cooked or manipulated in some way? And, and Paul Krugman, a very respected Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, floated out there, this being the Trump era, you can't completely discount the possibility that they've gotten to the BLS. But he did note that it's much more likely the models they use to produce these numbers, they really aren't raw data, have gone haywire in a time of pandemic. Uh, Mr. Krugman later on that day uh, you know, noted he was getting a lot of pushback from this and he apologized for any suggestion that a highly professional agency might have corrupted, might have been corrupted. But this being a political season, there was you know, plenty of uh, pushback and give and take on the issue. Um, Jason Furman said that you can 100% discount the possibility that Trump got to the BLS not 98%, not 99.9%, .9%, but 100% discount that there was no manipulation. Erica put out a tweet uh, saying she sees no red flags and she's going to explain that. But as you can guess, there was, you know, given Paul Krugman's prominence, there were uh, stories about this, about his tweet and about his apology for the tweet. Um, and it became one of those, you know, regular um, political death storms that we see. I would like to note that this is something that seems to happen every four years. In 2016, uh, then candidate Trump regularly criticized the job numbers saying that they were fake and phony and a hoax because at that time they looked pretty good for then President Obama. Um, this right here is a story from the New York Times in 2016 that is also talking about a similar dust up in 2012 when people were criticizing the jobs numbers and wondering is the Obama administration doing something to cook the books. So that's what we're talking about today. We want to see, we want to ask a former commissioner of the BLS, is the BLS cooking the books? I'm assuming the answer is no, but she's going to explain why it's a no. And she's also going to give us a, um, a very detailed understanding of what the jobs numbers are. I mean, we all pay attention to the headline, unemployment number uh, and unemployment rate but she's going to explain how they come, how those two, those two numbers are derived and how you as a journalist can kind of understand them and, um, and report, the, report on them in the best way possible. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Erica right now, but if you want to ask questions, raise your hand and we'll get to you in the Q&A session and, or, or put your question in on text. So Erica. Great. Uh, thank you, Chris. And thank you to the National Press Foundation and all the attendees. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. So I'm gonna run through this as, as Chris said, I'll take about 20 minutes to do it and then I'll be happy to answer questions uh, on the slides I show or other related topics. Um, 
And I, I understand that we have quite a bit of time after that for, for discussion, so I'll be happy to do that. Um, all right. So what I want to cover today is, first of all, just background on the employment situation. That's the official name of the jobs report. So sometimes I'll call it the jobs report, sometimes I'll call it the employment situation. I might even slip into BLS speak of calling it the EMPSIT. But that's what I'm talking about. And then I'll talk about how BLS protects data integrity, talk about the concepts in the current population survey, which is one, uh, one component, one uh, source of information for the employment situation, and then go on to talk about the misclassification issue. So this is what the employment situation, the front page of it looks like. Um, and as Chris said, it comes out usually the first Friday of every month and it's reporting on conditions about the middle of the previous month. So on Thursday, we're going to hear this sort of gold standard take on what things were like in the middle of June. Uh, and there are two headline indicators. The jobs report has thousands of numbers in it, but the, the headline numbers are twofold, the unemployment rate and the payroll job growth. And it's really important to understand that these come from two independent sources. The BLS does this so that you have these two different uh, kind of orthogonal looks at what's going on in the economy. Uh, and they, they, they each have different virtues and limitations. And so when you put them together, you get this full, more full picture than you would if you looked at either one of them alone. The unemployment rate comes from the current population survey, CPS, which is 60,000 households, and these rotate in and out. 60,000 households means it's about 120,000 adults. And it records the shares of people working, looking for work, et cetera, at, uh, as of the week that contains the 15th of the month. And it has a lot of detail by demographics, occupation, duration of unemployment, things like that. The payroll job growth, the other headline numbers, how many jobs were created. And this is from an establishment survey of over 60,000 work sites across the country, covering about a third of non-farm jobs. And it counts jobs, not people, but jobs during the pay period that contains the 12th of the month. And it gives you a lot of detail by industry. So if you're looking for information on jobs, you're gonna be focusing on the payroll job growth. If you're looking on information about unemployed workers, companies don't know about unemployed workers. You have to ask households for that and that's from the CPS. And most of the time today, I'm gonna to be talking about the CPS and the unemployment rate. Payroll job growth is an important part of the jobs report, but that's not, where the, um, that's not where the controversy was. So I'm happy to answer questions about the rest of it, but going on, I'm going to mostly focus on the unemployment rate. All right. Uh, so this, is, this shows you the unemployment rate from 1940 through 2017, and it shows you what recessions look like. The shaded areas are recessions. And one thing that you're going to notice as you look at the, the, the period of time right before each recession is that usually the unemployment rate starts to rise a little bit, but, but it's a slow upturn leading up to the recession. And then it takes off at the beginning of the recession. That's when you get the big spike. Um, and the other thing to notice is that the, uh, the, the global high is 15.8% in December 1940, and the global minimum was 0.8% unemployment at the very end of World War II, um, 1944. And uh, what we're seeing now, the so the unemployment rates that we're seeing now are near or uh, they're above this historical maximum that we've gathered with the CPS. You'll hear about unemployment rates during the Great Depression. Those are done by historians trying to look at comparable information, but they weren't done using this particular methodology. So, um, 
So let me talk about how BLS protects data integrity. Well, there are uh, two main parts. First of all, there's a real transparency of the methodology they use. And I list here a number of ways that this transparency is attained. We've got, uh, there's the handbook of methods, which is a, a great deal of detail on what the BLS does, their advisory committees, their notes, there's a lot of published stuff. They adhere to very tightly tight pre-published deadlines with a very regimented limited access process. And, and again, as I talked about, we've got these two independent surveys, which would have to, when they agree, gives you more confidence in what they're seeing. And some of them, in particular, the CPS is done in, in, in uh, collaboration with another agency, the Census Bureau. And then uh, finally, there's microdata access, which is that people, uh, after the fact, uh, researchers can get access to the microdata. There are other protections also. The commissioner is the only presidential appointee at the BLS. Uh, the commissioner is professional, has a four-year fixed term, only sees final numbers, and the staff has a very deep culture, a lot of training, background checks, criminal penalties against uh, any kind of manipulation. And then there are a set of practices that are promulgated by the agency itself, OMB directives, the Committee on National Statistics, and the Director General. And finally, the other important thing for you as journalists is to know that there really are red flags that would point to manipulation. If the data came out late, if it wasn't complete, if you saw a, a change in the processes or the staffing, or if you heard about staff reports, either leaks or to the OIG or uh, something like that, these would be red flags that would point to um, manipulation. And none of those have, uh, have, been in, uh, have happened with the BLS um, of late, certainly. So, but those would be the things to look for. And I don't think it's wrong to look for them. Fortunately, they haven't happened. Uh, sure, and for all of the listeners out there, a lot of those resources that Erica is talking about, such as the Handbook of Methods, uh, we will be providing um, a link to that and a bunch of other resources uh, when we post information about this webinar later today. So there'll be a full listing of, of, the, of how to access BLS data itself, as well as the Handbook of Methods, the advisory committees, um, some of the microdata and other, other resources that you can use. Okay, back to you. Okay, so let me talk now about the concept, uh, concepts in the CPS. What the CPS does, uh, now because 60,000 households, it, it, this is a large survey, but it clearly it's not, uh, you know, the, the whole um, you know, 300 uh, million people in the U.S. So the, the CPS is best used for is not so much counts of people, but for the ratios that you get from it, right? And so what the, PP, what the CPS does is it takes the entire population of working age people and it divides them up into very important buckets. And the first, and these are hierarchical, they're gonna they start with employed and they go down to uh, not in the labor force and they're mutually exclusive. If you're in one of these buckets, you're not in the other. So the first, they, they ask a, a set of questions that establish whether somebody is employed or not. That's step one. If they're not employed, then they get another set of questions to establish if they are unemployed or if they're not in the labor force. So that's the second step. Um, the unemployed plus the employed are the two buckets that are the labor force. And the not in labor force are people who are retired, students, discouraged, taking care of family members, and so that's a very large group also. And within that not in the labor force, we have some people who say they want jobs. The, the, the broadest group is the marginally attached. They've been in the labor force um, and uh, within the past year or just, um, and so there's a reason that, to believe that they really are attached to the labor force. And then within the marginally attached, they're the people who say that they're not looking because they don't believe there's a job for them out there. And the BLS captures all of these, but this shows you how they're related to each other. 
Now, the unemployment rate itself is a very simple calculation. You take the bucket of people who are unemployed, take that number, and you divide it by the size of the labor force, which is the employed plus the unemployed. And that's what the, uh, that, that's what the unemployment rate is. Within the report, the unemployment is segmented. It's segmented in a bunch of different ways. How you entered into that state, are you a new entrant into the labor market, are you a re-entrant, are you on temporary layoff, did your temporary job, and et cetera. There are also demographics. Uh, there's industry occup and occupation. There's duration of unemployment. And then two weeks after the employment in situation is released, the BLS releases a modeled uh, set of numbers for unemployment rates for, by state and metro area. There are also more measures of labor market conditions because the labor market is the largest and most complicated market in the country. And so it's very important to, um, to understand that to get a full picture of what's going on in the labor market, you're, you're never going to be able to answer that question with only one number. Right. And so the, uh, the employment situation provides a wealth of numbers so that you can dig into it more deeply. The headline numbers are useful because they're comparable and it's kind of, it gives you the headline, but you would never just read the headline and not read the rest of the story. Okay. So uh, BLS provides alternative labor underutilization measures. These are kind of add-ons to this concept of underutilized labor. Uh, the, the official unemployment rate in this nomenclature is called U3, and U4, 5, and 6 add broaden out that concept of underutilized labor. So use four adds in just the discouraged workers as if they were unemployed. U5 adds in all the marginally attached workers as if they were unemployed. And U6 adds in all of the people who have a job but are working fewer hours because their employers cut back their hours because there wasn't enough work. And that's actually the largest part of the difference between U3 and U6 is this part-time for economic reasons. And it's the part that varies most with the business cycle as well. Okay, uh, some of the other things you can look at is long-term unemployment, how many people have been out of a job for, for half a year or more, participation rate, how many people are in the labor market, EPOP, wage growth, hours worked, all of those are in the employment situation. There's another report you might want to look at, which is the JOLTS report, the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. That's a separate survey. It comes out with about a month lag, a um, month and a half lag from this. So it's, it's not as timely, but it gives you some of the churning information, job openings, quits, things like that. Um, uh, Eric, I have one question that came in specifically on this last slide from Regis O'Connor. Are U4, U5, and U6 mutually exclusive? They are, um, no, they, they, are, they, they are incremental. So U4 adds in discouraged workers. U5 um, takes not just the discouraged workers, but all of the attached workers. And U6 takes discouraged, uh, you know, all the marginally attached workers plus the part-time for economic reasons. So they are, um, yeah, so, so they, they are progressively broader, including all of the use before that. <laughs> okay. And I also just, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, Erica, but I also yeah. want to have another question coming in about whether uh, the viewers will be able to see these slides again. And yes, you will. They will be posted on our website later in the day, so you don't have to scramble to uh, get down every word on them. We'll be posting uh, the resources, as I mentioned before, as well as these slides, as well as the full uh, video and audio from this program. So, Erica. Great. Okay. So now let's uh, spend some time on COVID-19 and misclassification. Uh, so wh wh what's the issue overall? Well, the BLS believes that many workers who were temporarily laid off were misclassified into this kind of funny category of employed but not at work for other reasons. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, 
this is a reasonable category for the BLS to have because there, there are times when you have a job, but you're not at work. You're on vacation, you're sick, family care, parental, things like that, jury duty, right? And, um, and it, has, it has classifications for people in, in, those, um, in those, you know, up to those kinds of things. Um, and it even has an other category because sometimes there are other reasons why you might be employed but, but not at work. And it's this other category that went through the ceiling, right? Now, now these leaves from work are typically employee initiated. And that's the concept here that the employee for some reason has stepped away from work. Um, now, you, when, when you're on this kind of... Um, of leave, uh, you know, typically you are compensated, but you might not be compensated. Some employers will get, go and grant unpaid family leave or something like that. Unemployed, uh, I want to contrast this with workers who are unemployed on temporary layoff. They, they are unemployed because there is no work for them, right? And during COVID, uh, the shutdowns, this is the, the classification that BLS thinks is appropriate according to the concept of temporary unemployment. Right? Now, unemployed workers on temporary layoff don't have to be searching for work. Because, um, that, uh, so if you go back historically in all the data, the people who are on temporary layoff, they don't have to be searching for work. They also may receive some compensation during that time, a severance payment, a, um, uh, you know, some bonuses or something like that that were delayed. Uh, sometimes the employer uh, wants to keep them attached. So they, they sometimes will receive pay or benefits during that time. Uh, so it is a funny category, but it, is, it reflects the reality of the labor market out there. Okay, um, so because we had this huge number of people who went into this odd category, BLS said, whoa, we need to let data users know that this happened. And it's large enough that it affects the headline number. Un the official unemployment rate was underestimated because of this large misclassification issue. This has happened before, but it's never been this large. So during the partial government shutdowns of October 2013 and January 2019, BLS noticed that this happened. And of course, it happened in a large amount in March, April, and May in 2020. And how, how big is this now? Well, this gives you some idea of the numbers focusing on the impact on the unemployment rate. I have the four months, February, before anything was going on, then March, April, and May. And the first column in this, um, in this uh, uh, chart is, is, my, uh, is my calculation of misclassifications as a share of a temporary layoff. So I'm using the BLS's estimated impact of misclassifications. And I'm saying if they're all temporary layoffs, then what share of all temporary layoffs were misclassified? And if you do that, you can see that it started out 39% of temporary layoffs in March went into this funny bucket. And that um, meant that the, if, if the BLS estimate is correct, then almost one percentage point, you know, nine tenths of a percentage point uh, increase in the unemployment rate was missed because of these misclassifications. They, these people essentially got put into the bin of employed instead of being put into the bin of unemployed. In April, that number, that percentage-wise, the number went down. But remember, April had this huge increase in the unemployment rate. And so even though the percentage of misclassification went down, the actual impact on the unemployment rate was 4.8 percentage points, almost five percentage points of the increase in the unemployment rate was missed. In May, again, there was an improvement in misclassifications, didn't go all the way down to zero, but it, it, there was an improvement. Um, and this gave you an unemployment rate um, effect of 3.1%. And in this column, you can see if you just 
looked at, uh, at this, uh, it took the official rate and took the impact, what the unemployment rates would be. And here you have it in a graph, the official unemployment rate for these months is in blue. And if you uh, look at the unemployment rate, the official unemployment rate plus the impact of misclassifications, you can see what So this is consequential. You might then want to say, well, this is such a big deal. How did this happen? Well, as we all know, COVID really uh, affected a lot of things rapidly. Uh, many employees probably had very informal arrangements with their employers. Uh, sometimes they may have charged a leave category. Uh, they may have had little prior experience. They or their employers with temporary layoffs. And self-employed and contractors are particularly in a funny position because they sometimes do have some spells without work. And so they may have think of themselves as continually employed, but not having any work at the moment. Special guidance was issued to the census interviewers, even for March, that very first month, because BLS was afraid this might happen. Um, there, this guidance has, has had increasing effectiveness, uh, effectiveness, but obviously not total. And probably um, this has been a source of frustration to the BLS, on, uh, certainly. Um, they amped up their communication about this to the interviewers. And, uh, and believe me, they, they've been working very hard on this and they've, they've, made, they've taken some additional steps for June. So hopefully this number will be down. The bottom line though, is that this is a reflection neither of incompetence nor manipulation. Um, it is a reflection, one more reflection of the stresses that the COVID situation has placed on many other aspects of government and, and private operations. So one question that comes up is why not just fix the unemployment rate? If we have an estimate of how much it's off, why not just say, okay, the official unemployment rate is, uh, the, is no longer the one with allowing the misclassifications to persist, but make the adjustment. And th there, uh, the reasons are really important. The first of all, the first one is that actually changing respondents' answers would violate the practices that protect the integrity of the data. Right? BLS does not go in and change people's answers on an ad hoc basis after the fact. It just doesn't do that. Also, the BLS can be pretty confident that on an aggregate, it can say this number of responses is odd. But that's not the same as saying, which respondents did it, um, answered this question, these questions incorrectly. And so any, any attempt to reassign people would be imposing some judgment on which gender they were, which race they were, which, uh, which, um, where they lived, right? And because of this bucketing strategy, there's a whole set of questions that's only asked of unemployed people that these people were never asked, the duration of unemployment and things like that. And now they could, of course, just change the top line and not change any of the underlying data, but then the, that would make it inconsistent with the granular measures that we talked about by race, by gender, by geography, et cetera. So, Finally, this method that they used to try and uh, get at how, how much of a misclassification there was is their best judgment as seasoned professionals, but it certainly hasn't gone through all of the betting that is appropriate for a principal federal economic statistic. So that's why they haven't changed it. So now, what do data users do? Well, you have to take a deep breath. <laughs> This is not a good situation, but uh, yeah, you know, it's one we have to deal with along with many other crazy things that are going on with, at this time. Uh, first of all, ask BLS for guidance. They actually love to talk to journalists and data users, so do not hesitate to email, call them, read the things they put out. Secondly, I would say that you would mostly want to use the official rate to preserve the important consistencies. 
for broad policy discussions and talking about the depth of the impact of COVID, then I think using an adjusted rate makes sense. Right? And if you were a macro modeler, then you might want to do that also. I think you can expect, though, that the divergence will decline over time because of this increased uh, emphasis to interviewers and also because over time, the number of people on temporary layoffs is going to go down. And so people's understanding of their situation will clarify. And then the final thing that data users should realize is how important these data are, how important their independence is, and how important funding these agencies so that they can adapt and modernize is so that this information that you depend on so crucially will continue to be available to you. So now let me turn this over to questions. I appreciate having all this time to go through this and I'm happy to talk about anything employment situation or BLS related. Thank you. Tom Herman of the Wall Street Journal has been patiently raising his hand for the last uh, 25 minutes. I'm guessing is pretty tired by now. Um, we are unmuting Tom. And so, Tom, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, the first one I had was, are the monthly numbers, especially the income numbers, do they include um, executive pay or is it just, in other words, they include white collar worker pay. Also, why do you call it non-farm payrolls? Why do you exclude farm? And also, mm -hmm. I believe you exclude the military too, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Um, so, let, let me answer two parts on the executive pay question. Are executives included in the counts of jobs? Uh, the answer is yes. So executives are in the current population survey and they are counted in the, and they're, and they're counted in the payroll survey. Now, if you get to the, you look at their compensation in particular, not whether or not these people are employed, right? If you're looking at their compensation, that's a different question. Uh, their baseline salaries and, and their cash bonuses will appear in both of these surveys. So if you look at pay for them, that will be in there. But their, their non-cash benefits will not be in there. And for that, you have to turn to other sources of information that the BLS has, particularly the, empl particularly the employment compensate, um, the, the ECI, uh, uh, Employment Compensation Index, and the employee cost for empl employer cost for employee compensation. And that has the full range of benefits and compensation to, to, work, to uh, employees. Those, that, those numbers uh, have a longer lag and they are quarterly, but there is information there on that. Uh, the next question, why non-farm? Uh, it, it, it turns out it's very difficult to get information on, on farm workers um, that, 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 you know, so if you're an employee of a company of a large farm corporation that has, um, uh, you know, that, that has regular employees working for them, that, then you're going to be in that. But if you're, but if you're so, and that would be in the agriculture section. But if you are a worker on a small family farm that probably includes a lot of family workers, et cetera, that turns out to be a very difficult thing to measure uh, and very costly for the BLS. And so the decision was made early on to say it's, it's, it's just too complicated to include that in the payroll job survey. But you are included in the current population survey. So it's not that that sector is totally um, ignored, it's just not going to be in the, 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 the payroll survey. Uh, military, why are the military excluded? Uh, part of that's national security uh, because the military doesn't want to have this information available to uh, to, the, to the rest of the world with the kind of transparency that the BLS thinks is important. And so the military is, is excluded for that reason. All right, so we have a question from uh, Karen Roos of 
New York Public Radio. Um, I'll just read the question. Where do jobs fall into what category that were forced to close due to governor's executive order? And do these numbers factor in the underground economy, such as hairdressers that continued working out of their homes, um, even though their jobs were temporarily forced to close for quarantine? So the, the first question is easy to answer. This is uh, most of the people who are in that cat in the category of working at a place that shut down should be on temporary layoff unless they were told explicitly by their employer, um, you know, this is a pink slip and when I open up, I don't know who I'm rehiring again or something like that. So you expect that anyone who's in this category of a place being shut down, whether they're being paid for part of that time away or not, would be in the temporary layoff category. Um, underground workers are not going to be in the payroll survey, but in concept, they are in the current population survey because the question never asks, are you on the books or off the books, right? The questions in the CPS is, did you do any work for at least an hour for pay or profit during the week that contains the 12th of the month. So they are intentionally included in the current population survey. Uh, whereas the payroll survey is built up from people covered by unemployment insurance. And so it's not going to include anybody who is not who is a, a contractor or self-employed and is not paying into the unemployment insurance system. Now that's 96% of employment, but yeah. But okay. All right, so we got a question from uh, Ian Schmoot. Um, uh, how can you tell or how can you tell which records in March, April, and May were misclassified? Are you, are you able to tell or are you estimating, guessing? Yeah, yeah the answer is uh, you can't really. Uh, you, can, you can say this bucket looks way too large, uh, but you can't tell for sure. And that's, that's really why BLS did not even try to reallocate people. First of all, they couldn't have done it that quickly, but, but also it would have violated their practices. They, they, they don't know for sure who who is misclassified. All they can say is, whoa, this makes no sense. This is usually a tiny category and it blew out a proportion. Okay, I have a follow-up here from Tom Herman of the Wall Street Journal. How does BLS or Census choose which households to survey and do they get mm -hmm. paid? Yeah, uh, so I'll answer the last question first. No, the people who participate in the current population survey are not paid and it is voluntary. Uh, nevertheless, it has a much higher participation rate uh, than any private survey anywhere. And that's because people understand that they are performing a valuable public service. And how are they chosen? They are chosen by the Census Bureau on the basis of residences in the country. And so if you are in the current population survey, it's because your residence was chosen and you are living in the residence that was chosen. Okay, uh, I have a question here from um, Tom Bellin, a, a professor in the Department of Biostatistics at UCLA, mm -hmm. um, and uh, who says he got his, in graduate school, he was an intern at BLS. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you describe the extent to which BLS routinely carries out studies to gauge measurement er error or misclassification error in, error in the current population survey? Mm -hmm. So I can't answer that question super specifically, but I can tell you that BLS has a cognitive lab where they bring people in or interview people regularly to test the questions that they're using. So they, um, so that's an ongoing process to make sure that the questions are still properly phrased and, and to help uh, BLS transmit guidance to interviewers to make sure they answer the questions well. Uh, they ask the questions well and respond to queries about what, what does this mean, right? Um, BLS also uh, will uh, put test questions onto the CPS and look at answers to those in order to try and understand people's responses better and test possible changes in wording. 
They don't change wording of questions very much at all because they want to maintain consistency over time, but they may change some of the, uh, the guiding prompts. So for example, they used to, when they asked people, how did you search for work? You might imagine that, uh, inter that online search has meant that now they give different prompts for, for people to say, uh, when they're saying, did you search for work? Uh, what did you use to search for work? They'll offer different prompts now that include online options that before didn't exist. So it's an ongoing process to keep the survey relevant and fresh. Um, and with this, uh, this misclassification issue, um, I, I can't, I don't know what, uh, what work was done between 2013, 2019, and, you know, and now on, on trying to deal with this, but it certainly, whatever they did certainly resulted in this special guidance that they gave to the interviewers in advance of March. And clearly it was, you know, um, it was, uh, was partially effective and, uh, and I, and I, they're continuing to give the same guidance, but with more and more emphasis. And this, my understanding is that this month, they even put something into the program that pops up for the interviewer if the respondent starts to go down that misclassification track. Okay. Um, we have a question from Haley Mensick, an associate editor for Healthcare Dive. Can you explain how exactly the unemployment situation reports are adjusted by BLS after the fact? On the current population survey, um, the, the household survey is basically not adjusted after the fact. Once it's published in the employment situation, it sits, that's the historical number, that's what it will always be. There's some minor adjustments when they change the seasonals. And if, if um, if the census adjusts the population numbers, then you can get some different estimates of, of the actual numbers implied of people employed or unemployed from the survey. But as I said from the CPS, you mostly want the ratios, and so that won't affect the ratios. So anyway, so the, the short answer is the CPS numbers stick. The payroll survey numbers are revised several times. They're revised with late reports for two months and adjusted seasonals. And then a year later, they're revised when the whole series is rebenchmarked to the universe. So the payroll numbers are significantly revised. The, the CPS numbers are not. Okay. We just have time for a couple more questions. And I want to ask you about the uh, trust in your data and BLS's data and kind of how often it gets caught up in the political. Um, in political fights. So you were commissioner of the BLS from 13 through 2017. It yes. was in you know, 2014, 15, 16 that then candidate Trump was regularly criticizing the numbers, uh, saying that the unemployment number is a complete fraud. Um, that, was, that was actually back in 2012. Uh, in 2014, unemployment is a totally phony number. Um, in 14, in 2016, don't believe those phony numbers. Um, mm -hmm. So you heard that a lot. So my mm -hmm. question is, I mean, how, how do your workers um, react when they're getting attacked that way? And do you as an, did you as, uh, as an agency, you know, decide that you needed to respond or have other people respond on your behalf? I mean, how do you, somebody's completely saying, consistently saying what you do is a fraud. How do you, how do you handle that? Right. Now that's a, that's a good question. Um, what the CPS has done, uh, even before I got there, was always uh, maintain transparency and be willing to explain why they're doing what they're doing, but only go that far, not engage in tit for tat with people impugning the, uh, the veracity of the numbers with the idea that that's kind of a no-win situation. Uh, therefore, it has really fallen to the journalists and outsiders with an understanding of what BLS does to engage more actively in uh, uh, diffusing, um, 
uh, the, you know, these spurious allegations. So uh, one thing I did though, while I was there knowing that, that this was real, I mean, uh, and certainly uh, the 26 campaign was not unique in the 2012 campaign. Uh, uh, there were attacks by, by, um, by Welsh of GE, um, also on, on some of the numbers. So what, Jack Welsh, that's what it was. Um, what, um, what we did was make sure that we had enough resources up on the website that were always there and up to date that showed people how it is that BLS maintains the integrity of the numbers. And those resources are up there still, and they're kept up to date. And so this is a place you can always go to see what are the practices that maintain the integrity of the numbers and, um, and, and, and how BLS has been updating those over time. So the, um, it, what, uh, the BLS strategy is to just provide this information to maintain the reality of its independence and integrity, and, um, and then to explain to people why these are important. So I think it's, um, it's effective, it's sometimes frustrating, and it's, in some ways it's a pleasure to be on the outside so I can say things <laughs> a little more actively than I could while I was on the inside. But BLS has a lot of friends and a lot of um, uh, people on both sides of the aisle who have a lot of respect for the work. And finally, this will be the last question. It's kind of a pretty big picture question here from Karen Rouse of New York Public Radio. What do these figures tell us about the working lives of Americans right now? Can you mm -hmm. offer your thoughts having watched trends? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so I've actually been writing uh, some, uh, some blog posts, uh, both for Cornell and for John on some of these questions. Uh, one, of the th uh, one of the things that I did with the May data, I'm planning to redo it for the June data, is dividing uh, the impacts up by demographic groups. And uh, it looks pretty clear that the impacts are worse for women than for men, and worse for African American, Hispanic, and Asian workers than for white workers the size of the impact and to some extent the, uh, the, the kind of impact. I mean, it's obviously worse if you, you lose your job permanently than if you're on temporary layoff or just have a reduction in hours. So um, I think th they, these numbers give us the overall impact and then allow us to chop it up somewhat, but we also can welcome the wealth of new data sources that help us to dig a little bit more granularly into these impacts. Um, and this is sort of how they're faring in the market, the, the job market, um, you know, the labor market. Beyond that are things that the BLS doesn't measure, but we know are related to labor market impacts, such as um, distress measures of various kinds. And the Census Bureau, in partnership with a number of other agencies have started these pulse surveys that are weekly, that are asking much more detailed questions of, on the impact of people's lives. And so if you wanna go um, deeper into those sorts of issues, I recommend that you look at the pulse surveys. They've been undercovered. There isn't a write-up that accompanies the numbers, they're just the numbers. So this is an opportunity to delve into it and provide the first draft of that history. I'm sorry, the Pulse numbers, those are, those are, those are BLS numbers? Uh, the, the Census Bureau is the one and putting it out. But the Got BLS it. collaborated with Census on the questions. And it also um, it, uh, had, there are questions in there for the National Center for Health Statistics and from uh, some other federal statistical agencies as well. So it's to get this water look. <laughs>